We now welcome into the show for another loaded Maddich Monday, ESPN college football insider, analyst, expert, all-around good man, Trevor Maddich. Trevor, great to have you back on the show. Were you scoreboard watching as closely as we were for BYU football over the weekend? Yep, I was scoreboard watching at the beginning, and when I saw them go up so much in the first half, then I was actually watching the game too. But the uh, then I paid less attention to it because I was watching eight games doing college game day on ESPN radio, right? So BYU was up there. And then I was also paying attention towards the end to see, you know, how the, some of the young guys would do and everything else. But, you know, no matter what happens, it's important, even if it doesn't seem important because of the score. And that second half was in some ways just as important as the first. Trevor, did enough happen this weekend given BYU's 59-14 victory over Idaho State? They, of course, take care of business. But with the four teams above BYU in the college football playoff poll losing number three, number nine, number 12, number 13, did enough happen there that BYU makes a jump in the college football playoff poll when it's revealed tomorrow night? Yes, I think, Spencer, that they will they will edge up. There's still a lot of football left to be played, both by teams in front of BYU and teams behind BYU, and, of course, BYU. They have to take care of business as well. The committee is big on who you beat and who you lose to, right? And so you look at Auburn. Auburn lost to Texas A&M, ranked number 14th. They'll move up in the poll, and they're just a couple of spots above BYU in the last poll. We'll see what happens tomorrow on Tuesday when the committee comes out with their latest ranking. But the thing about, about Auburn, they picked up their third loss, but the committee will see that they lost to – Penn State early in the season on the road. Penn State was ranked number 10 at the time. Then they lost to number one, Georgia. And then they lost to A&M, which, again, is going to move up close to the top 10. And they have a chance, Auburn does, to pick up a quality win when they play Alabama at home at the end of the regular season. And that might allow Auburn, even with three losses, to move up ahead of BYU, even if BYU is 10-2. and two. So, you know, you've got to watch ahead and behind. An interesting one really is Oklahoma State because they sit at number 11 right now. They won this last weekend and they will have to play Oklahoma in the regular season and maybe Oklahoma twice if they make it to the big 12 championship game. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there, but Oklahoma could knock Oklahoma state behind BYU. Uh, Michigan state was number three last week. They lost, picked up their first loss, but at the same time, they still got to play Ohio State and Penn State, two teams with very good passing attacks, and Maryland, by the way, a team with a very good passing attack as well. And that's Michigan State's Achilles heel. The Spartans could potentially pick up another loss or two, which could put them behind BYU, even though they started, you know, they were number three in the last poll. So it'll be interesting to see what happens up there. I guess the 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 summary is that BYU right now is in really good position to get up to number 12 and possibly have a chance at the new year six. And that is, you can see the scenarios playing out, but they have to look not just in front, but also behind at other teams that have some possibilities at real quality wins as the season wears down that they can use to jump BYU. See, Trevor, I think the most interesting part of what happened over the weekend is obviously all the teams ahead of BYU Cougar fans wanting all those teams to lose. But the one maybe you didn't is Baylor, and they obviously did lose. That's a team BYU already has a loss to. So you said that you think BYU could climb up maybe as high as 12. With both teams having two losses, speaking of BYU and Baylor, do you think that the committee would leapfrog the Cougars over Baylor, knowing that the Bears have already beaten BYU? Jason, if they do that, I'll be mad at the committee. Because if two teams have the same record and there's a head-to-head, the committee must respect the result on the field. That's why they put Oregon ahead of Ohio State in their first ranking last week because they they saw that even though Ohio State is right now much the better team, Oregon beat them head-to-head, and they both have the same record. If Oregon and Ohio State both win out and become one-loss conference champions, I don't care how good Ohio State is. I don't care that they get to play highly ranked teams like Michigan and Michigan State down the stretch. I, it's important to me that the head-to-head be respected as a player. As a player, I don't want you know, a bunch of people in an air-conditioned room with shrimp and con- croissants catered in there for a nice <laughs> meal to find some algorithm that they can plug into a spreadsheet that would overcome my victory on the field against that team and that, that would be just wrong. And so if it's wrong there, then it would also be wrong here. 
And as long as BYU and Baylor maintain the same record, Baylor must stay ahead of BYU because of that head-to-head. But remember, we're assuming BYU wins out right now, and that's not a done deal. Uh, But they've they've got to take care of business. But Baylor still has to play some tough games, including Oklahoma once and maybe twice. So things will take care of themselves. Okay, Trevor, with that backdrop of knowledge that you've just given us on where Baylor fits into this and the head-to-head against BYU if they have the same record, which they do right now, do you see the Cougars, this week at least, jumping up to maybe number 14 with Baylor just ahead of them at number 13? I think that's a, a good possibility, Spencer, because the Auburn picked up their third loss. And there's a pretty good chance BYU will move ahead. But let's just assume for discussion that they move up to 14. They're in range of that top 12. And and the New Year's Six is still in play for BYU. I mean, they don't have a win over a team that is ranked right now. But Utah has been playing lights out recently. They host Oregon in a couple of weeks. And they will probably play Oregon again in the Pac-12 championship game. And if they go on and win out, or at least if they if they beat Oregon in one of those two games, especially if they win the Pac-12, it'll give them a lot of juice in the committee's eyes. So that's a positive thing. So BYU fans need to be really big Utah fans for the rest of the season. And then as far as uh, the rest of it goes, there's enough potential chaos ahead of BYU that if they take care of business, they could move up and get into a position to still make a New Year's Six game with two losses. What about Cincinnati, Trevor? They got the win, but just... Like in previous weeks, just a very unimpressive win, and it could have easily gone the other direction. But again, they got the win, and the committee's already told the Bearcats the reason they weren't in the top four and that they were placed at number six was because they didn't like the fact that they weren't blowing out these teams that they should. With another situation this past weekend of the exact same thing, what do you make of Cincinnati's chances of possibly moving up? Well, Jason, they're not giving the committee many reasons to move them up from a standpoint of style points, are they? I mean, they're undefeated. But the last three weeks, they have played down to the level of mediocre competition. I mean, Navy's not a very good team this year. Cincinnati beat them 27 to 20. The next week, they were ahead of Tulane, one and six at the time Navy or Cincinnati played them. And it was 14-12 at halftime. Finally, Cincinnati pulled away late, but it wasn't impressive. And then this game at Tulsa, you know, they, they had to stop Tulsa on eight plays inside the 12 yard line in the final three minutes in order to preserve that eight point victory and not potentially take it to overtime. So the committee's looking at that saying, these are all teams with losing records and Cincinnati is not blowing them out. But here's the thing, Cincinnati just might not need style points. Now that Michigan state has lost, because if you look at what's happening up above Cincinnati, I mean, Michigan and Ohio state will play each other. That will cancel each other out, right? One way or the other, one of those teams will be up ahead of Cincinnati and one will not. Uh, What they need then is two things, basically. They need Cincinnati. They need Oregon to lose, at least one, pick up their second loss. And they need Alabama or somebody else in the West, SEC West, to win out but then lose to Georgia in the SEC championship game by more than a touchdown. So it's not a close game. If that happens, then one SEC team will make it. No Pac-12 team will make it. And only one Big Ten team will make it, nobody from the ACC. And so that would still give Cincinnati a really good chance at the fourth spot if those things happen. And those things are very plausible. It's not out of the question, even without style points. So much fun to watch all of this unfold. Obviously, BYU fans cheering for Cincinnati to get into that playoff because then it would open up seemingly another at-large spot that BYU could climb into. But we can discuss more of that as results continue to come out in the next three weeks. I do want to ask you, Trevor, about the actual game for BYU last Saturday against Idaho State. I know it's Idaho State, but BYU wins by 45. What was the best thing that BYU accomplished in a game they should have dominated? That they got out to such a big lead lead at halftime. Everybody expected them to, they did. It wasn't perfect, you know, turnover, things like that. But they got that big lead, which allowed the second half to be the half for the younger guys. Now, BYU is already playing a lot of younger guys. They have very few seniors on this team. And so most everybody will be back next year, although some underclassmen may go off to the NFL. But they were able to get some of the guys that were even younger than that into the game to get some experience. And that's important for next year because competition at every position is something that BYU needs to be able to compete at the highest level, especially as they move into the big 12 
in a couple of years. And by letting guys that are not just the young guys that are in the rotation play, but guys that are behind them get in and get some time, that's good. And so I don't mind at all that BYU, you know, struggled to move the ball in the second half, et cetera, et cetera. That's okay. Because a lot of that is not talent, but it's chemistry. And getting some of those guys on the field to get their feet wet allows them to understand what that what needs to happen for that chemistry to be built. So the fact that they went out to such a big lead at halftime really helps their depth going forward. BYU announced over the weekend that uh, Kingsley Suamataia, is the, the transfer from Oregon, is now at BYU. And I'm not asking you specifically about him. But when you have a five-star recruit out of high school that's now coming to BYU, and BYU's been able to get some commitments from other guys over the last couple of months, high-ranking recruits, whether or not you believe in star systems or not, it's still impressive. What are the optics of that with BYU starting to get the attention of these types of players? It is spectacular, especially with BYU going into the into the Big 12 to be a Power 5 team in a couple of years. Because now, top recruits will take another look at BYU as a possibility, and some of them will like what they see, things that they wouldn't have seen had they not considered BYU to start with. So you talk about you're, you're a four- and five-star recruit. You're seeing other guys either commit to BYU or have BYU in their finalist list, and you're saying, well, why in the world? What, what do they see there? Maybe I should check them out, including uh, a five-star defensive back out of Florida that has BYU now in their top five. And that might change, but that list includes Alabama, Ohio State, Florida, Georgia, guys like that, teams like that. And so other highly recruited players will see, okay, who's being recruited by Alabama? Wait a minute, he's also being recruited by, he's also what might go to BYU? Who's being recruited by Ohio State? Wait, he also has BYU on his list? Those kinds of things really help from a standpoint of not just the optics, but the, the ability to get in the door to make a pitch. All those guys obviously won't come to BYU, but more will take a look. And because of that, some will come. Trevor, for the record, you are a five-star analyst, and I hope you know that. I appreciate you saying that. That's uh, five on a scale of, of four to 25. <laughs> <laughs> come on now. Hey, it's great to talk to you. We always appreciate it. Another Manage Monday. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks, guys.